Uh, thankful that for those that we have visiting with us as well this morning, and I, I know you've already been welcomed, but I want to do it again. Uh, I do want to say that uh, we, we're so fortunate to have been able to have Wayne and Emily with us over the last several months, and they are in the process of moving to North Carolina. Wayne's going to be working with a church there, uh, and I... I um, I have mixed emotions about it because I'm very thankful and happy that he's going to have that opportunity. I know the church is going to be so built up by it, but, uh, you know, sometimes you live close to somebody, you take them for granted, and I think about all the times that we didn't get together when I wish we would have. We had several times to go to the bookstore, and he'd give me some tips on what to look for and uh, get breakfast or lunch together, but not enough. Uh, this, this life is just so short, it's too busy. But I do look forward to that home in heaven when we're going to be able to be together forever. But we want to keep Wayne and Emily both in our prayers as they're going to be out there. I'm grateful it is there and the weather and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I think uh, we'll have to find excuses to go see them sometime too. But um, please, please keep them in your prayers. They've been a great encouragement to me, uh, to this church here, and to all of us over the last few months as they've been attending with us. And uh, we want to. Uh, the, the help them a little bit with if there's any other needs that come about uh, I'm sure that we'll be eager to help with that because I know that they will be doing a great work there I want you to ask I want to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and I do mean 1 Corinthians this time I think I I was uh, intending 2 Corinthians earlier this morning and got that mixed up. But 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 and 13 is where we're going to be starting out. You know, we, in the first hour of study at 9 o'clock, we went through Romans chapter 4. And as I meant, uh, mentioned, uh, Peter speaks about the fact that Paul has written many things that are hard. Romans must be he was talking about. Romans 14 is right there in the belly of it all. <laughs> There's just so much there to deal with. So uh, I used a lot of your bandwidth this morning in that first hour, and I know that you're probably still thinking, wow, I don't even know where, you know, uh, to put all of these notes and everything. This hour, we're going to be a little bit simpler. So you can relax, just take some notes, and make some really practical application. Because what I want to talk to you about this morning is about as practical as anything really could be in living the Christian life, and that is the issue of overcoming temptations. And I, I think that there are very few studies that could have a greater practical application on those who, who desire to live in harmony with God's will, to bring glory to His name, and ultimately to live eternally with Him. I think all of us are looking for better ways to be more successful in our walk with the Lord. And there's not an easy button, as the old commercial used to say, uh, but there are uh, tactics. There, there's wisdom that is found in the Scriptures that can help us to be able to do that. And, you know, if a person is happy uh, in sin and, and living for the Lord's not the priority of their life, then this lesson is probably not going to be of much value to you. But for most of us, we want to learn how we can be more successful in overcoming temptation and not having to live with the regret, the fear, the guilt, uh, and, and bringing that shame on the Lord, uh, there's no doubt His grace is amazing uh, and, and His love is everlasting. And, and I'm still in awe, completely stunned by His forgiveness again and again. But I don't want to have to keep using that. Uh, he died so that I can live for Him. And that's what I want to do. I know that's what you want to do. And I, I remember, especially as a young person is feeling so inadequate in facing so many temptations and and that as I look back on it maybe had, was a little bit willful ignorance but I don't believe that that's the case in in a lot of we are familiar with young people here I'm tremendously impressed with the spirituality that I see and the in the young people the young couples those that are are growing Spirit, many new Christians here that are uh, striving to walk consistently, and this is a consistent challenge, is how do I overcome these things? Well, again, I, I don't have any rocket science or anything probably new that I'm going to be able to share with you, but just go 
simple keys, these fundamentals that the Bible gives to us, sometimes helps us and reminds us, oh yeah, you know, this doesn't have to be that hard. This is what I need to do better. And it may be that only one or two of these stand out and you realize that's what I've been missing. That's the part of the equation that I need to put together. But whatever the case, I hope that you'll follow along. But in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, verse 12, Therefore let him who take heed you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And Taylor was talking last week about the fact that we're not looking for that way of escape. We know that that way of escape is there, but maybe we don't really want to see it because we want to do what we want to do. Or other times, we don't even know how to recognize that way of escape. God's telling us that we can overcome. But I want to suggest to you some things that we can do. And the first of those is that we need to recognize when we are being tempted. That may sound overly simple, but I want to tell you this is crucial. It's crucial because we cannot know when we're being tempted unless we know what sin is. So let's go a step behind knowing when we're tempted, and that in order to know when I'm tempted, I've got to be able to recognize and know what sin is. And how am I going to know that? Am I going to go to the world and say, hey, what's sinful? Well, you know as well as I do that the world's going to lie to you. Matter of fact, I don't know that the world calls anything sinful today. They mock at the idea of sin or any transgression of God's will. So we're not going to find it there. Am I going to find it in some legal book? Or am I going to find it uh, within myself just through some meditation or, or just getting to know myself better? Certainly not. Uh, Jeremiah said in, in chapter 10 that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps. It's not going to be through uh, determining it in some human way. The knowledge of sin is not innately in man. Now some people are going to tell you otherwise, but we don't have that knowledge innately within ourselves. Now we're generally raised in a culture where we understand that there is such a thing as right and wrong, but that is all trained. That's by nurture. It's like setting an alarm clock. You set it wrong, you don't wake up on the right time. And so when we are trained, when our sense of right and wrong is trained wrong, our conscience can't be trusted. It's not innately in us the knowledge that there is a right and wrong might be, but what is right and wrong is not. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 goes with the Jeremiah passage I just mentioned. The wise man in Proverbs 14 and 12 said, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. What we've got to realize is that God's word identifies sin. What is right and what is wrong? In the book of Romans in chapter 7, Paul said in verse 7 that he would not have known sin or known what sin is without the revelation of God's Word. And he used the example of, I would not have known covetousness unless the Lord said, you shall not covet. And so it is up to God to tell us what His will is because sin is simply the transgression of His will. If I don't know His will, I can't know what sin is, and I can't know His will innately. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 speaks of that in verse 10 and following about the fact that no man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man that's within him, and thus no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And those things have been revealed through the apostles, written down in God's word, and that's where we're going to have to go to be able to find those things. Romans chapter 1, in verses 16 through 17, he tells us that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, to faith, the just shall live by faith. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Verse 16, in 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 17, he simply says, all unrighteousness is sin. And you put those two passages together. If all unrighteousness is sin and the gospel is the power of God unto salvation because in it the righteousness of God is revealed, then we find out what sin is, right? These are pretty simple points here. But it just reminds us of how important Bible study is and that we need to spend time in God's Word. It's not just an exercise. It's not just a Christian thing that we do. We don't just come for Bible class and study the Bible or exhort one another because that's just something that Christians do because this is just a, our, our book that we live by like other people live by their books. 
this has a very practical side to it. You remember in Proverbs chapter 7? In Proverbs chapter 7, he tells us about a young man that was devoid of understanding. And he warns us about the the terrible sin that this young man fell into and the deception of an immoral woman who led him astray. He clearly did not know when temptation was there. He thought he was safe. He even expresses it this way at the end of the chapter as he speaks about she has cast down many who were strong men. That is, they didn't believe they were in danger. They didn't know the, the danger when it was there. Look with me over in the 119th Psalm at a a passage that I know you're familiar with, but it comes into play here and it needs to be remembered in this regard. The 119th Psalm, we're going to look in verse 104 and 105. The psalmist in the 119th Psalm in the 104th verse says, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. And we put that together, we understand that, he, that God's precepts warn us about false ways. We get an understanding of what is false, what's the wrong way, the, the path that leads to a trap. We don't want to go down that path. So verse 5, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is the value of God's word in that way. Now notice as we go back to Psalm 19, earlier in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 19, The psalmist states here in verse 11, Psalm 19 and verse 11, he's speaking about God's word and the value. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. Verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are pure. And uh, verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold. Then in verse 11, as he's talking about God's word, his commandments, his precepts, he says, moreover, by them your servant is warned and in keeping them there is great reward. Young people, there is so much more to getting the Bible, to to getting it, to to understanding it, to to have a clarity and to be able to put it together. Bible study, listening through a sermon and taking notes to be able to understand. That's why we're going through the book of Romans the way that we are, so that it's not just some abstract book of theories and of ideas but that it is practical in our walk with God. And and the more that we do that, he tells us that we're going to be protected. There's going to be an understanding and a warning and, and, and a safe way that we can go as a result of that. We need to spend time in God's word as we find ourselves in sin over and over again without ever realizing that we've been tempted. That's the frightening thing, is that we could be in a situation where it seems like it's happening over and over again and we don't know what we're doing wrong. That's a good indicator that we do not have the knowledge of God's Word that we ought to have. But a second thing that goes along with this is that not only do we need to recognize when we're being tempted, and we're going to recognize when we're being tempted if we know what sin is, when we see a desire for what is sinful, we know that's temptation. We we need to do something about it. But there's another point here, and that is we need to recognize the source of temptation and its consequences. The source of temptation is not some sinful flesh that Calvinism teaches. We were made upright, and we have wholesome desires. It's just that God has provided certain venues or certain ways that those desires can be fulfilled in a way that's pleasing to him and by that same token there are ways that those desires can be fulfilled that's not pleasing to God so that that's sinful but it's not because of our nature and it's not because of the flesh these things are not sinful uh, in in every regard there is a righteous way to fulfill the desire of the flesh the problem is the more that the flesh is satisfied in a way that's not pleasing to God, the more that we can develop unwholesome and sinful desires, sinful in and of themselves. And so so we've got to be able to realize that the problem is not inherently the flesh. The problem is the source, and the source is Satan. Temptation to sin is not because of the way that God made us. Temptation to sin is not because of God. In James chapter 1 and verse 13 through 16, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. 
God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when he, his desires con, uh, has conceived, it gives birth to sin. You say, well, wait a minute. His own desires, he's enticed. Who entices us? Who is the one that entices us to fulfill those desires in an unwholesome way? It is the deceiver. It is Satan. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter 5 and 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The way that he devours us is by lying to us just like he did with Eve. She could eat of every tree of the garden but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What did he do? He found a way to entice her to eat of that tree. When she could have eaten of every other tree, he draws her attention to that tree. He makes her aware of what is prohibited. You know, what's prohibited sometimes seems like it's got to be the most prized thing, you know, the, the wise man in Proverbs speaks about how the deceiver works. He says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. No, it's not in the long run. At first it might be, but it, in, in the end it's bitter as wormwood. He says, don't believe that. It's a lie. It doesn't work that way. But that's what Satan did with Eve. Oh, God just doesn't want you to to have what he has. Oh, he, he's got something great, and you could have it if you ate that, but he doesn't want you to have as much pleasure as he has. He's lying. And that's the way that he entices us, to fulfill a desire in a sinful way. And once we realize where the, the, who the source of this is, then we can understand who we're up against. And we can win the battle a lot better. You know, we were talking about this when we... We're going through the study on bitterness uh, last week in our adult auditorium class. And one of the things that I kept stressing was the fact that we've got to understand that Satan is our adversary in this. Our bitterness is our own. We don't need to be saying, well, it's your fault and it's his fault and it's her fault. We've got to understand bitterness is my problem. I developed it. I can fix it. And Satan is the source of it. That person is not. I'm not saying that, that this person didn't uh, do something wrong to me. They probably did. But they're not my enemy. They're not my adversary. Some people want to make themselves my adversary. And I want, to, I want to suggest to you, I believe that's only for the purpose of taking my eyes off of my true adversary. The best way to get rid of an enemy is to make a friend out of them. Satan will always be our adversary. He is the one that is lying to us. He is the one that is tempting other people and enticing them to look like our adversary or to hurt us in some way so that we get a focus on them. And if he can get us to become bitter with them, he's got two for the price of one. Satan's your adversary. Quit looking at this other person and focus on him and figure out how to undo what he's trying to do, how to conquer him, how to crush him under your feet. And the first and foremost way is don't give in to the temptation he's using on you. I've seen so many gospel preachers that I've had high regard for that have given in to temptation, have destroyed their credibility, their work, their influence. And I have been fully aware that Satan wants to destroy me he wants to destroy you he wants to destroy your family your life and every influence that you have and what that needs to do is to simply call us to a stronger and a more fierce determination that we are going to conquer him and tread him under our feet and to understand that he is that source in order to really make something out of that, though, is we've got to have an appreciation for the consequence of succumbing to temptation. It's not just a, a white lie. It's not just a my bad. Sin is far worse than that. Isaiah 59, our iniquities 
separate us from God. Romans 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. That's eternal. It's separation from God, and eventually that will be eternal death. In Revelation 21 and verse 8, it is that lake that burns with fire eternally. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 in verses 7 through 8. Galatians chapter 6 in verse 7 through 8. Paul writes there about the uh, challenge that uh, we have with sin. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. This is the con- consequence. All sin has a consequence. There's going to be a reaping. It's going, to, it's going to eventually grow up. And you always reap more than you sow. This is the consequence of sin. And that helps us to realize why we need to know the source of temptation. We need to know its consequences in order to stay clear of it. But something else that we need to be aware of is we need to recognize that while we can sin, we don't have to sin. This is a very important part of being able to overcome sin is realizing that we don't have to sin. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people that, that wear the name Christian and, and, and I think that they, they want to do a lot of good things, but they have adopted a doctrine that is unbiblical that says that we have to sin or that man has this total inability to live above sin. And all of that is absolutely self-defeating. What is the use if I can't win? If I'm just going to sin again and again and again because of my nature, because of something in me, what's the use in trying? Because I want to tell you, it's a battle. It is a fight. But the reality is we don't have to. And the more victories we get, the fewer losses we sustain. And eventually... We have a whole lot more, we enjoy a whole lot more victories than losses. Because with every victory, there is a, there is a, essentially a conditioning. You know, it's, it's when you figure out how to do something, you're immediately conditioned to know how to do that. You watch a child as they're working with something. I, I was watching Corey the other day as she was putting cards back into a pack. And, and I was kind of amazed as she, she got them all in there eventually. And she folded the little ears down and then the big flap put it in. It's like she'll know how to do that from now on. That's conditioning. Until you do it, it's like which one goes first, you know. And, and it's a puzzle. How do I do this? But once you do it, you're conditioned. And that's the way overcoming sin is. When we win those victories, we realize that's how it's done. I can do that. I showed myself I can do this. God gave me a victory here. Praise God. I'm not going to fall to that again. And we might here and there, it may sneak up on us, but it's not going to be something that we're looking at scared to death thinking, I don't think I can do this. It's all about victories. And that's why we started with 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. And God gives us a way of escape. Every sin. I don't care what it is. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how new you are as a Christian. I don't care what the case is. God's giving you a way of escape. You need to be looking for that way. We have no excuse for temptation overcoming us. I can sympathize with you. We need, to, we need to weep with those who weep, and we need to encourage one another. I'm not saying I don't feel sorry for you. I do. Anyone who sins, I do. What I'm saying is, though, let's be real. There's no real excuse. Considering the significance of this subject, I want to suggest that this is truly one of the greatest promises that we have from God. And I know that ultimately that that great promise that we have in Jesus Christ of an eternal home in heaven with him, that that moves us on. But I want to tell you that this hope, this, this promise that we have, that God will give us a way of escape with every temptation, wow. Are we really applying that? 
Are, are we really putting that into play? We're told to resist the devil in James 4 and verse 7. What's the outcome of that? What's the use? Resist the devil. Yeah. And, and what's going to happen then? He will flee from you. If God tells us to do it, we can do it. But never be so overconfident that we lose our watchfulness or think that we're strong enough to just handle this in our own way because that's not going to happen. But going along with the first point that we made, we need to hide God's word in our heart. This, this is what we were talking about earlier, but listen to what the psalmist says in the 119th Psalm back in verse 9 through verse 11. In the 119th Psalm, in verse 9, he says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's a, a metaphor. It's a figure that is used to say, The more that I take in God's word and keep it on my heart, and throughout this is all about meditation. It's not just about reading. You see, meditation is that mental chewing gum where we take God's word and after we've read it, we think about it. We talk to others about it and we think about it some more. We think about this application. We think about that application and we go through it. We have so much time to do this. So much driving time. We have, we have so much time that we spend on our phones that could be spent in meditation. Time in the morning when we wake up. Before we ever look at an electronic device, show some discipline and choose to do some meditation. That's how we hide God's word in our heart. And maybe he's using this idea of hiding it because we're putting in a place where it's not going to be easily removed. Maybe it has reference to that parable of the sower where the tempter came and snatched away or took away the seed that was sown on the hard ground. I don't want him to take this away. We need to put it in our heart where we'll remember it. Jesus' example of overcoming temptation in Matthew chapter 4. Over and over again, his answer was, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. See how he had God's word hidden in his heart? God's word is the answer to temptation, but if we don't know God's word, we won't have an answer. And we need to have an answer for the moment, not just later, not after the fact. It takes knowing and meditating on this to make God's word known. And that's why the psalmist in the first psalm in verses 1 and 2, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the pathway of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Paul puts it this way in Colossians 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dwell to make its home, to live in you. Let God's word make its home and let it live there richly, abundantly. You know, there are some key verses that you can commit to memory that can help you overcome temptation. Like Galatians 2 and verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. We were studying about selfishness in our adult auditorium class this morning. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That puts self where it belongs. And that solves the issue of self with sin. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. In Romans 13 and verse 14, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Yes, we've got to put God's word in our heart. And with that last verse in mind, we see our next point, and that is we need to remove ourselves from temptation as much as possible. Truly, as long as we're in the flesh, we're going to be tempted, and we would have to go out of this world to be completely uh, uh, away from or to completely avoid temptation. It's impossible to escape all temptation but we don't have to provide opportunities for it. That's what Paul was saying in Romans 13. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I was talking about the flesh's desires. There are 
There are wholesome ways to fulfill them. There are unwholesome, sinful ways to fulfill them. He said, don't make provisions for the wrong kind of fulfillment there. You're not to do that. When we know that something or someone tempts us, we need to avoid it as much as we can. And that's really what's at issue a lot of times when we're young. I think that a lot of times we know that this person is a liability to us, this friend, or maybe this place, but we want to believe we can do it and resist. And that's what Proverbs 7 is written about. Many who were slain by her were strong men. (laughs) They thought they were strong enough to be able to resist this. And he says, don't do that. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18, flee sexual immorality. That temptation is so overwhelmingly strong. He says, run from it. Don't mess around. Don't dabble with it. Don't think about it. Flee sexual immorality. 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee also youthful lusts. There are some things that we need to run from. And that word flee is not walk away. It's running for your life. Don't hang around. Don't see how close you can get to it. Sometimes the greatest way to fight temptation is simply to flee. And I want to go back here to Proverbs chapter 7 and and read specifically a couple of verses here. In Proverbs 7, as he introduces us to the young man, he says in verse 8, passing along the street near her corner, he took the path to her house. Then as he gets to the end of the chapter, he says in verse 21, With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Dumb. He had no idea. That's the point. He didn't even know what he was walking into. Or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost his life. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she's cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Don't stray. Don't take that path. Don't think, well, it's okay. I'm a strong Christian. I can do this. There's some things that you need to flee from, and that includes people. 1 Corinthians 15, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Some people need to be We just need to stay away from what are these what is the corruption of these good habits gossip filthy speech lust drunkenness all of these things that that's how we're led into that and i think it's foolish and even hypocritical when we pray that god would lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one when we are unwilling to flee from those that tempt us Yeah, this is about as practical as it gets. But then also, finally, we need to spend time with God in prayer, asking for his help. And I want to suggest to you that praying may often be the key to overcoming temptation. In Hebrews chapter 4, I want you to notice with me there in verse 16, Hebrews chapter 4. Listen to what the inspired writer says here about the importance of this Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 16 he says let us therefore come boldly that word doesn't mean arrogant it means confidently let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need you know this is one of those things that we all probably say amen to. I mean, intellectually, we know two plus two equals four and prayer elicits help from God. We know that that's true. Isn't it strange having known that? How many times we fail to practically actually do it? I I mean, just in the day-to-day routine, something comes up We need help, we're being tempted, and we don't stop and say the first thing I need to do is say a prayer. Then I need to run. (laughs) Or or maybe I need to run and then I need to say a prayer when when I stop and catch my breath. 
But it needs to be one of the first two things that we do. And I really do believe that it is often the key to overcoming temptation. How many times do you think you would be overcome by some temptation if when you recognized that you were being tempted, you just stopped and you knelt down and you prayed to God to help you make the right decision in this? You know, one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to quit wanting to go down that path or you're going to have enough fear to flee from it or you're going to quit praying. That's just the way that it works. It would be seldom that you would rise from your knees to sin. How many times do we not stop to pray because we actually want to give in to the temptation? I'm not asking you to raise your hand because I know the answer. It is a common thing for us when there's something, when we want to stay bitter with this person, I know I need to pray about it and I'll do that in a minute. But right now, I'm going to just be bitter because I'm going to come up with a way to get some vengeance. I'm going to come up with a solution and it's going to hurt them really bad. There's all kinds of reasons that I know I need to get rid of this and I'm going to do that soon. But first, I want to, I want to immerse myself in it a little bit further. It's crazy. I know when you say it that way, it's nuts. But it really is what we do. Because we think that we're going to get some kind of of fulfillment, some, something's going to happen, we're going to get what we want if we keep rolling that through our mind or if we keep looking at something that is generating lust. Just one more look and then I'll stop. Never works that way. In fact, you'd be amazed how quickly the tempting nature of that temptation passes when you spend time in prayer. Because God is merciful. We will find grace to help in time of need. And you know what that is? Many times, you know what that grace is, that help that we need? It is clearly seeing the way of escape. But if we're not looking for it and we don't want to see it, that's another reason why we don't pray. Yes. Do you need help in knowing how to resist some temptation? James 1 and verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he warns us. To ask in faith. But he tells us that the double-minded man will receive nothing from God. If we're asking God to show me the way of escape, and then I'll decide if I'm going to do it or not, God's not going to give us anything. We need to make up our mind. I'm going to walk with you, Lord. I need you. I don't want to give into this. Show me the way of escape. And James 1 and 5 says, it'll be given to you. But we've got to have that commitment first. Do we really believe in the power of prayer? Have you prayed to God about helping you? You know, in James chapter 4, he says in verse 2, yet you do not have because you do not ask. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Of course, prayer is not a substitute for our cooperation and effort in applying the truths of God's Word and the other five keys that we have before us here this morning. All of these are crucial. It may be that you have employed several of them And it's just one or two that you realize, that's what I'm missing. That's what I need to do. Brother and sister, I hope whatever it is that you'll be able to take from this and what God has given us and that you'll be able to win the victory more consistently, more and more every day, and then reach down and lift someone else up and show them that path. God wants us to win. He's on our side. He will do everything that he promises if we are willing to seek him and if we truly desire to walk with him in a way that brings glory to his name. If you're here this morning and you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, we don't want to leave without extending the invitation of Jesus Christ to you to come believing in him as the Christ, the son of God, to confess your faith in him, to repent of your sins and to be uh, uh, baptized in water for the remission of sins. All your sins can be washed away. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, do that before you leave this morning. Come forward and make that known. If as a child of God, you have been failing in your fight with sin, you know how to fix it now. If you need our prayers, if you need a fresh start, we want to pray with you and for you.